A compensation occurs when one element tries to compensate for a derangement in the other element. For example, the respiratory component may try to compensate for a derangement in the metabolic component. Let's go back to our type 1 diabetic suffering from a ketone acidosis. Acid is being produced by ketones, which is pushing the metabolic component in an acidotic direction. The body can respond to this metabolic acidosis by signaling the lungs to work harder. The work of breathing will increase and the carbon dioxide levels in the blood will be pushed downwards. The metabolic system may be pushing in an acidotic direction, but the respiratory system is attempting to compensate for this by pushing in an alkalotic direction. The net result is a blood pH that is neutral. We would describe this example as a fully compensated metabolic acidosis. Fully compensated because the alkalosis produced by the respiratory system has fully compensated for the acidosis resulting from the metabolic system. Let's look at another example. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an autoimmune condition where the body's own immune system attacks and damages the body's nerves. In severe cases, nerves controlling the respiratory system can be affected and the sufferer's ability to clear carbon dioxide can be reduced, leading to a respiratory acidosis. The kidneys, however, can compensate for this by secreting more bicarbonate. Increased levels of bicarbonate will effectively push the metabolic system in an alkalotic direction. In this example, the kidneys have produced enough bicarb to push the acidosis some of the way back towards a neutral pH. We would therefore refer to this situation as a partially compensated respiratory acidosis, as the metabolic system has not fully pushed the pH all the way back to neutral. Hopefully, you're now beginning to develop a good understanding of how respiratory and metabolic compensation occurs. Let's finish by looking at a couple of examples of ABGs. Here we have an example of an ABG that represents quite a typical scenario that we'd see in an ICU environment. So we have a patient that's been involved in a road traffic accident and they've needed, as a result of their injuries, to be intubated, have a breathing tube put down their throat and to be attached to a mechanical ventilator. They'll have been then sent to the ICU for treatment and during that time the mechanical ventilator is going to have taken over the work of breathing for them. So your respiratory muscles, your diaphragm, your intercostal muscles, like any other muscle in your body, will become weaker if they are not being regularly used. This patient has been attached to a ventilator for 25 days, so that's 25 days of their respiratory muscles getting weaker and weaker. But they've recovered from their injuries and they've got to a point where we've been able to extubate them. We've been able to detach them from the breathing machine and take away the breathing tube. A couple of days after we've taken away the breathing tube, and this patient appears to be struggling. They're short of breath, they're using their accessory muscles. We take an ABG and it looks a little bit like this. This might be a good point for you to pause the video, have a look at this ABG and see if you can work out what's happening before we go through it together. So the first thing we'll look at is the pH and we can see that it is acidic. So why do we think this is? Well given the patient's recent past medical history, we would suspect the respiratory system. We know they've been ventilated for many, many days. We know that their respiratory muscles have probably got weaker and weaker in that period. And if we look at the CO2, we can see that indeed it is elevated. So weakened respiratory muscles haven't been able to sufficiently clear enough CO2 out of the body. And blood CO2 levels have become elevated, pushing their pH in an acidotic direction. This is in fact your classic type 2 respiratory failure. We have got low oxygen levels in the blood and we have got elevated carbon dioxide levels. So the next thing to consider is, is there any evidence of metabolic compensation? Is the metabolic system trying to compensate for this respiratory acidosis? Well, if we look at the bicarb levels, we can see that bicarb is 31. It is elevated. The kidneys are starting to up their production of bicarbonate and push more bicarbonate into the blood to try and combat this respiratory acidosis. However, the pH is still acidotic, so we know this isn't fully compensated. We're going to describe this as a partially compensated because the pH hasn't returned back to a normal range, respiratory acidosis. Our second ABG has been taken from a patient suffering with sepsis. 
as we know, one of the complications of sepsis is a buildup of lactic acid in the blood. Therefore, we could reasonably expect this patient to be suffering from a metabolic lactic acidosis. And we can see from this ABG that the lactate is in fact elevated. Not only that, but we have a reduced bicarb level, which we would think consistent with a metabolic acidosis. However, if we look at the pH, we can see that it's neutral. It's within a normal range. The metabolic acidosis is, of course, being compensated for by the respiratory system. In response to the elevated lactate levels, the lungs have begun to hyperventilate, blowing off more CO2 and pushing the body into a respiratory alkalosis. We would describe this ABG as representing a fully compensated metabolic acidosis because although metabolic factors are pushing blood pH in an acidotic direction, the respiratory compensation has to push the pH all the way back to neutral.